now we have uh, actually 20 minutes. Uh, if you allow me to also steal a couple of minutes from our lunchtime, uh, I hope I will not be directly punished um, for discussion. And uh, you are very welcome to uh, participate in this and to uh, present your questions either by raising a hand or uh, by uh, typing them uh, through the uh, application. And I have um, one question for each presenter, just to get it started. So first, I would like to turn to Professor Banting. And uh, perhaps, uh, well, we all have noticed that in Europe recently, there's been a surge of right-wing discourse. And uh, in a way, it's a backlash to multiculturalism. There's been discussion that it could be uh, due to either globalization and people are searching for meaning in their roots and start uh, increasing othering, or uh, because they were not winners uh, in this uh, European uh, model or in this European dream. So could you share your ideas based on Canadian experience on how to, uh, how is it possible to counter it, to prevent it from increasing? Okay, um, well, uh that, that's not a simple question, but let me um, uh, try and distill it reasonably quickly. I think it is the case that in comparison with the United States and with uh, many European countries, Canada has not seen the same kind of uh, right nationalist backlash against immigration and against multicultural policies. And so why might that be? Uh, I think it has, uh, if we back up and ask what has been driving that in other uh, contexts, it is a combination of economic anxiety on one hand, driven by the forces of globalization and technological change and a general sense of insecurity in populations that they're, they're less certain about their economic futures, they're less certain about their children's economic futures. There is a kind of economic anxiety which is common across many countries. And on the other hand, there's a cultural anxiety that uh, society is changing very rapidly and in many ways um, it's the speed of change, not the actual level of diversity, but the speed of change which is politically most unsettling. Where you get the really strong nationalist backlash is where those two anxieties, the economic anxiety and the cultural anxiety, merge and reinforce each other in a kind of toxic context. And so far in Canada, we have been able to avoid that interaction. Canadians are just as worried about their economic futures as anyone else. Um, and they have high levels of cultural diversity, but by and large, Canadians believe fundamentally that immigration is good for the economy. When asked, 80% of uh, Canadians say yes to the proposition that immigration is good for the economy. There is not the same sense that whatever all the other sources of economic anxiety might be, immigration is not one of them. And so, so far, we've avoided the issue, the interaction. The reason Canadians believe that about uh, immigration is that we have a very strong emphasis on an economic stream of immigrants. Um, select, they're not all, we have refugees, but it's a small portion of the total, and we s actively select people with high levels of skills. The average immigrant to Canada has a BA. And in that situation, their integration into the economy is smoother and Canadians can believe that this is a uh, positive economically and you don't get the cultural and economic anxieties reinforcing each other. That's a long answer yep. to um, a short question. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, next, I would like to turn to Daria. And uh, your presentation dealt a lot with this othering thing, but also uh, it sounded very related to the question of stereotyping and to a specific stereotype of Russian-speaking minority in, in Estonia. Do you think that it actually stands, uh, especially those uh, um, uh, images or, or that image that you could you saw through your research is it really valid for the whole of Russian speaking population here in Estonia or is it more right for some uh, maybe even generations 
uh, and for others it might not be already so correct. And then what, what do you see could be the mechanisms for reinventing this identity that would be uh, common and acceptable both for the Russian speakers uh, and understandable for the Estonians? Uh, and perhaps uh, inc more inclusive and more positive that wouldn't, uh, uh, well, be even politically conflicting in some points. Yeah, thank you for your question. So uh, first, I think that um, the way I present the data, you should remember that it is focused on you younger population. So there will be serious generational differences that I am no, in no position to comment and we all know about these differences in integration levels and how the social programs address them in different matters. So when we talk about younger um, Russian-speaking population here, I think that what we miss is a narrative of that category of people being able to uh, contain more than one identity. So we're still struggling with the idea that you have to choose between black and white categories and it never fits the reality. It's, it's very conflicting for integration purposes. It's bad for self-perceptions. It's not a um, psychologically safe environment in, in some sense. And um, the mechanism through which we're able to counter these processes is probably learning more about the other. So, um, I assume that we all realize that, and also something that I would like to show you with examples from my research, that there is a significant overlap in epistemic resources between the two groups, in opinions, in uh, linguistic resources, and the general um, attitude to the world, the future orientation, and we should be able to talk more about the similarities, because they do exist, and use them, and capitalize on them for this common ground, rather than trying to find those uh, very minor differences that of course also exist and should also be talked about, but they should not be the first thing that we talk about. In order to establish a dialogue, we have to have something in common, and uh, I say that it exists already, we just have to be able to find it and to talk about that. Yeah. Thank you very much, and I think uh, Daria's response uh, very much resonates with the, what was the message of uh, Marek Dam about the need for, on one side, cultural identities or le a cultural level of identities and multiculturalism and political identities. So my question would be, do you have a vision or uh, kind of, uh, or what is your vision about what could be the ground narrative or the basic narrative for this political identity that would be inclusive for different cultural uh, minor, uh, majority group and minority groups without uh, compromising their uh, cultural identity mm -hmm. and uh, supporting this multicultural uh, context. Yeah. Well, I could make two points. First, uh, indeed, uh, if you want to promote this multiple cultural identity at schools, we need also multiple perspective history teaching, for instance, or, or in any other uh, classrooms, meaning that we have to offer various perspective, we have to offer various experiences, and not to impose one, let's call it, national narrative to everybody. So this is the first step that has to be done. But then, what could be this one common narrative? Of course, it has to be, uh, I, let's call it, civic narrative, or, or the narrative of the state. And for instance, right this year, we are celebrating the, the 100th anniversary of the Sona Republic. And this actually should have been an occasion for promoting this common uh, narrative for everybody living in this country who are one way or another affiliated to this very republic, uh, instead of, 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 of using this anniversary for promoting national identity in the ethnic sense of the term, uh, which quite often has been the case, uh, I, I have to admit. Uh, therefore, yes, I mean, on the one hand, we have to promote those different multi-perspective narratives in classrooms. On the other hand, we have to promote this uh, civic narrative based on the political values common in this country. Okay, thank you. And um, I would like to give floor uh, for the questions. Please ra raise your hand high. And when you are given a microphone, please present yourself. Uh, yes, please. So there's a need for a microphone. It's coming. It's coming. Yeah. And pr please say your name and affiliation as well. Hi, uh, Victoria Preston. Um, I am a, a strategic communications person, so I'm affiliated with the, the Centre for Strategic Communications at uh, King's College in London. 
So I wanted to ask you a question about, you were talking about narratives, uh, about what the government can do at a governmental level to close the gap between the, the kind of emotional uh, rhetoric around identity and nationalism, as you just mentioned, and a progress towards uh, converging these two parallel lines, particularly on education. Yeah, I would actually rephrase almost the same answer I just gave, that uh, state throughout this education system has to promote or force the, those multiple perspective narratives, meaning to share different experiences via different uh, types of, of, of narratives, and uh, while providing a kind of uh, 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 covering uh, uh, a civic narrative uh, in order to uh, find common ground uh, for everybody uh, living in this this country based on those constitutional and other uh, values. So, so it's yeah, it's it's first step is always to be very aware that uh, uh, that instead of of imposing just one single perspective to everybody in the school system, we have to uh, strengthen this very awareness of 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 multiple perspectives, and then therefore still trying to find some common ground in order not to fragment uh, the community to the, to the extreme. Perhaps if I could add, uh, multi-perspective would require also dialogue Indeed. in order to not only explain own point of view, but also accept yeah. and understand uh, yeah. the validity of the other uh, point of view or the motivation uh, behind it, exactly. uh, which might increase uh, understanding and cohesion in a society instead of uh, building tension. Mm -hmm. So, um, more questions, or do you feel? Yeah. Yeah. So okay. back microphone, please. <laughs> uh, so it's really, the structural point that I was trying yeah. to get at, and which I clearly missed, is whether uh, it's not about what is the policy inside of schools, or mm -hmm. but what at the at the national level, where is the big conversation happening in the in the public domain? Is the there public a public discourse? Uh, the, the, I mean, a government-led public conversation. Yeah, I would say there is no such thing like government-led public discussion, and I'm happy about this. I mean, there is a public space where we have different uh, points of view, and, and but this public discussion is, is also carried out throughout the private media as well. But that's, that's why, in, from my perspective at least, the school system, the education system, is the major, if not the only, kind of tool the state has in order to promote certain idea of, 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 of nationality, of identity, etc. I don't believe that the government can impose an agenda over the public sphere, what should be you know, discussed or what should not be discussed. This is about you know, <laughs> freedom of press after all. But I do believe indeed that much can be done at the school level in order to promote those values I um, was advo advocating for. Okay. Um. More questions, or perhaps uh, some of you would like to add a comment to this discussion? Yes, no? Okay, so there's a question, yeah. please. Uh, I think I'm getting a question. First of all, my name is Ade Kunle. I'm an expert here in Estonia, did my master's here, and I work with one of the startups. I think a question tends to be more about the perception, and maybe she's not getting the right answer. For example, uh, while at work, I speak a little Estonian anyway, and my colleagues respond and they correct me. But when I go outside and enter a shop, I speak with someone, and then they're like, hello, good morning. What that tells me, first of all, is you are not one of us. I know you, your skin color tells me you are not from here, and you can't speak this language. But uh, that doesn't still deter me from trying to speak because uh, I observe when I try to speak with older people, they respond and they correct me if I've made a mistake uh, because my landlady is an elderly woman in her 70s and she's very encouraging about. So I would like to know what is the perception because I feel this has to do with perception as well, that what do people perceive foreigners? Now I know the discourse has been more about Estonian, uh, ethnic Estonians and uh, 
Estonians, that are Russian speakers or Russian natives, whichever way you decide to call them. So what is this perception about, about foreigners in Estonia? I think we should also try to say something about um, Do you direct it to someone in particular? Yeah, um, I think that should be to uh, Professor Tam, because mm -hmm. he was talking more about this cultural <laughs> and... Okay. And maybe Dare as well. I, actually, yeah, I would say it's, it's, I would be happy to give the floor to Dare because I mean <laughs> the, the question of othering is is very much an issue in this context. Yeah, but I can please. compliment later if you like. Well, I can give you the other perspective about this cognitive economy principle, which we have stereotypes that do help us, and it's not something intrinsically bad. It's the granularity that we miss. So, because the narrative exists for uh, the only foreigner in Estonia so far being the Russian speaker, and it takes decades for this um, concept to be more um, enriched with detail. So, when you encounter this situation, this is a stereotypical example of when people just do not expect you to be interested in this culture, not because of any judgmental ideas, but just because they don't imagine a situation in which you would be interested. However, there is this dialogue, so like there is a mismatch about what people uh, truly believe in and how they act and what they think is the ideal society. So in the ideal society, and we have this discourse already when the president talks about that, you know, if somebody has the same values as us, they are, are considered to be Estonian and they themselves should consider themselves Estonian. So this is a more inclusive future-oriented society. But it's going to take a lot of time before people and the lizard brain are, will be able to process that in the moment. So this is my comment to you. Okay. Could I just add um, a word? The, the, the phenomenon you describe of having people switch <clears throat> immediately to English uh, is a very common phenomenon. It's not you, clearly unique to Estonia. You get this, exactly the same dynamics in Canada, which has had a uh, hundred years of experience of immigration of people of, of diverse backgrounds. I, I do think that the, uh, the, only, the only ray of hope um, I could offer based on the Canadian experience is that a very common response among the older generation of Canadians when meeting a person of color is to ask, where do you come from? Assuming this person was born outside the country and has come as either an immigrant or maybe just a visitor. Uh, and the, often the response is, well, I come from uh, Scarborough, which is a region of Toronto. That is, these are people who were born here, their families have been here maybe for multiple generations. They are as Canadian as the person they're speaking to. Uh, in the younger generation, that response is less common because the younger generation has uh, grown up in a context in which um, a city like Toronto is multiracial and multi-ethnic, and their school, the people they interacted with in school uh, were more diverse, and their, their friends' patterns are more diverse. And so uh, my only response would be that the phenomenon you discuss is common across countries, um, and if there's any hope, it is that through generational change, these patterns fade. Um, I, I really do think in these areas, change is slow and multiple generations are involved. Okay, any addition? Um, thank you, someone presented a question through this tab, so I have the honor of reading it out. So what is the role of citizenship uh, in multicultural policies? Is allowing double or multiple citizenship uh, a somewhat positive or negative impact? Does it have positive or negative impact when it comes for better integration of immigrants? And in the case of Estonia, are there any changes that we can expect to see in this particular policy of citizenship? So about the future, perhaps you're not the, this question could be kept for tomorrow's political debate, but... <laughs> Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm personally very, very much in favor of multiple citizenship, and, and the Estonia discussion is still going on, and there are a few political parties who are for having this tool, citizenship, the other are very against it, so I can't, re can't really see a consensus in the horizon, but I think it's becoming increasingly uh, important issue considering how many Estonians are making establishing families outside of Estonia, and I hope that within a few years it will be resolved in a way that even Estonian citizens can have a dual citizenship, indeed. Okay. Uh, 
Dr. Ben. You well, you probably know about the fact that you know this citizenship um, in itself is kind of a, a golden pot, you know, across the rainbow for the Russian speakers. And then once you get it, you hold on to it, um, you know, for your dear life. Because once you get another citizenship, you are ha you have to give it up. Because if you get that through a process of naturalization, then it's the one that you can also lose easily. I think it also adds to the concepts and maybe when the um, there was equal access to that citizenship and also holding it and preserving that in the transnational, transcultural society, maybe that will also contribute to some equality within the society. Okay, thank you. Um, I would uh, simply add um, one, one point. Um, uh, we, we have dual citizenship in the Canadian context, and I think it's been very useful. Uh, it's not totally uh, accepted. There's a little anxiety underlying. So uh, people, th there was a surprise flashpoint recently on this question when uh, it turned out that the, the governor general is the equivalent of head of state, uh, not head of government, head of state. It turned out that the governor general previously, a woman... Uh, a minority woman who was being appointed to this post, equivalent of president of a republic, I guess, uh, had dual citizenship. And there was such a tremor. Her, her, the, other French, the other citizenship was French. And there was such a tremor through the country, she felt, felt required to renounce it before she took up that role, as if the Canada and Quebec were going to go to war. Uh, so when I say that Canada has had dual citizenship for a long time, it doesn't mean there is, isn't occasionally under, underlying angst about it. Um, I actually think dual citizenship is uh, very important, but it relates to the question of what is the role of naturalization and what is the role of citizenship. Uh, in, um, uh, I, I think you, one needs to think of citizenship and naturalization as a stage in the integration process, not as a reward for completing the integration process. And as a consequence, getting people naturalized early, I think, tends to have a positive effect on their sense of identity with the country and their sense of engagement. Uh, and so anything you can do to facilitate naturalization, including making it easier, not requiring them to renounce the citizenship of the past, I think facilitates that process, and that in itself is in a boost to a stronger sense of identity with the country. Uh, I don't know if any of that resonates here, but that's certainly the dynamic, I think, in my own country. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, this discussion. Our, the red sign says that our time is up. So I would like to let's give a great thank you and round of applause to Professor Keith Banting, Dr. Daria Bartina, and Professor Marek Tam. Thank you for active participation, and I think perhaps Hannes would like to say a few words before we go to lunch. No? Yes, I would like to say thank you for leading this panel discussion. <laughs>